So next up, we're going to have uh, Masu Sharma give an update on uh, current irrigation research here in the state of Minnesota. Masu is the uh, irrigation extension specialist and we've been measuring since like 2017, 18. Uh, uh, so she's been working for Josh Stamper. Uh, she's going to talk about uh, a bunch of different things, but I'll let her introduce herself. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. My name is Mr. Sherman, communication specialist at the University of Minnesota. So I'm from the planning department. And I'll be talking about irrigation research and some updates, some data that will be found in the last few years. And I started working here mainly on research. Uh, but first of all, I want to congratulate the soil water district team here. They are doing a really, really great job in terms of I look at the results, and not many of the districts have that much adoption of the irrigation schedule to do. So, you guys are doing great. I think I, I like what's happening in this area in terms of irrigation. So, starting with the uh, little outside next door, I'm going to do this. Starting with the introduction why we do irrigation, why we do irrigation research, and then briefly talking about. Uh, four projects. So, quickly giving you an update what's happening in the job road and the extension and outreach efforts that we are trying to do here in the state. So, we are gathering here because we all, most of us, dedicate and we, we care about education and we know how important it is for our economy. And at the same time, as it brings profit to our system for our crop production, at the same time, it's very important for our uh, environment. So with water scarcity issues and water quality issues, now it's the high time that we think about how to manage that irrigation. And most of you are doing it very efficiently, but to think about how we can develop those data sets or fundamental relationships that we really need to advance our education management in the future. So that's where irrigation research becomes very important. And people like me who are working at the we have that flexibility of Doing things that you cannot do on your production farms, right? Like when you are when you are growing a crop, you cannot just rely on zero irrigation, or you cannot do that on your farm. Or when you are doing nitrogen trials, you cannot put 350 pounds of nitrogen or zero nitrogen, right? So to test those trials, to test those things, like how different rates of nitrogen, different rates of irrigation, different kinds of irrigation, you know, new sensors work, or if they work, if they don't, in what climates, what soils they work. That's where we come in and do all that research to help you guys in deciding what's best for you. So the challenges that we often face with irrigation is sometimes we over irrigate if we don't use uh, efficient ways of doing irrigation scheduling, or we do under irrigate. If we over irrigate, there are chances that we cause that nutrient to leach from the root zone and contaminate the groundwater. And there are, you know, in Minnesota because we are irrigating the sandy soil, very poor structure soil, then Aquifers are not too deep, there is a problem of nitrogen like, leaching in many areas. So that's a big concern with over irrigation. And you're also using more energy when you're pumping more water than your crops need. And you're wasting that you know, water when you're over watering because all that water is either going in runoff or to the deep percolation. And then decreases recharge to lakes and streams. As I said, the aquifers are very shallow connected to the groundwater. So when you're over pumping, there are times when we decrease those stream levels and which has an impact on the medical systems. Under irrigation at the same time, if you're not using efficient ways of scheduling, you might be under irrigating your crop that needs more water that you are putting on so that has a direct impact on crop yield quality, total biomass and overall net return and profit on the farm. So it's very important that we use some efficient ways of of irrigation management to improve our water efficiency. So, improved irrigation practices, and most of you know about this. What we can do, we can do soil moisture sensors, we can track weather and look at when to irrigate, when not to irrigate, use different kinds of irrigation schedule tools, using procedural irrigation management like variable irrigation, and now there's a lot of funding for these kinds of things that we can do. But at the same time, there needs to be some research and extension outreach efforts to, to fight because there's so much in the market. Days to test those systems and to make sure that they are working or not, and how would they work. So, research efforts I will be talking about the first one is public effect on irrigation and nitrogen based on quantity and some other 
what it might be for preparators. Then waiting for procedure education management, how very given rate education or more precise education management compares to uniform rate. And the third project is kind of similar to the second one, but uh, on the research part, the second one is on our grower with our on grower's farm, collaborating with him. So we didn't have much flexibility of doing things, but then after completing this project, we moved into a more detailed project of looking at how procedure management interacts with procedure nitrogen management, irrigation and nitrogen. Uh, and that's on the research part. And then uh, developing some irrigation scheduling tools, and most of you, uh, I think you saw your tail come, he was the bulk network operations tool at the beginning, uh, the irrigation management assistant tool. Uh, then I'll be talking about it because we got some funding from FCCMR again uh, last two years ago that they're expanding this tool to statewide and adding some new uh, or more, more things to the tool. So the first project is essentially the objective is to evaluate how irrigation and nitrogen interact with each other and develop those fundamental relationships of if there is any interaction, how would that impact from yield, from productivity, both nitrogen and water use efficiencies, and nitrate leaching, of course, because that's, as I mentioned, the huge concern in the sandy soils. And then develop some best management practices that optimize water production uh, and water from water usage. And then the third objective, which I'll not be talking too much about today, is uh, developing some proximal and remote sensing based information for in season. Uh, irrigation and nitrogen management, which is another objective of this study that we are focusing on. So, we'll be, uh, we are collecting some remote sensing and proximal sensor data from the field under the different irrigation and nitrogen rates to see how we can use that uh, relationship for in season management for variable irrigation and nitrogen. So, uh, going a little bit into the study details. So, this study initially was planned for three years, starting in 2020, ending in 2022, but last two years being very bright, 2021 and 2022, we decided to continue it two more years, so we are doing it this year and next year as well. So we will have five years of data uh, from this study, and two locations, West Coast, which is in Polk County, and in Becker, uh, a sampling research farm at the University of Minnesota. Both locations have four stretched soils, uh, semi and both are in vulnerable groundwater areas. And when I say vulnerable groundwater areas, it's when there is high leaching potential. In terms of treatments, we had four irrigation treatments, with four rates of irrigation, full irrigation, which means that whenever our soil moisture sensors tell us that our soil moisture is at a level that our crop is going to be stressed, we fill that soil profile back to close to the capacity. So that's our 100% irrigation. And let's say 100% irrigation today is 1 inch, we reduce that by 25%. So the amount for 75% will be 7.75 inches, 50% will be 5 tenths of an inch, and then we have zero irrigation, no irrigation without sensor. And then 6 nitrogen rates, starting from 0 to 350 pounds of nitrogen per acre with 70 pounds increment. And then in combination, we have 24 treatments that are applicable. Four times. So each location has 96 plots, and how we can set that up? So this big red box is one replication. Within each replication, we have white boxes which are irrigation treatments. So this whole box will get same irrigation, and then within each irrigation, we have six nitrogen rates. So we are from each of these plots, we are collecting some data to understand what's happening. So we are, as we already. Concerned about nitrate leaching and interested in that, we installed a suction of isometers uh, at each location. So, two isometers per plot. So, each location has 192 isometers. So, at Becker, for example, we have six acres area where we have all these plots. So we have 102, 192 isometers installed in those six acres to really understand how much nitrate we are leaching under each of these treatments. And what is a uh, little bit detail of what the lysimeter is. So there's the PVC pipe, and at the bottom of this PVC pipe, there's a suction on the porous cup. So, and this, this PVC pipe has a stopper on top that's so this tube is always under suction pressure. Once you have water below the zone, then it 
the stuff is installed at four feet depth, okay, below the vertical zone, the soil pour water under tension, it starts filling up this peak, right? Filling up in every peak with the farm. We remove the suction, we collect the water sample and empty this piece, right? Send this sample to the lab for testing for nitrate and then put the piece of pipe back under suction so that it can collect the next week's data. So that's how we collect this water sample every week from each of these tubes uh, and around throughout the season per year we collect around 10,000 water samples that we test. And then we also collect uh, soil moisture from each of these treatments. So we are using this very advanced or very good technology, neutron Probe, I don't know if you've seen it, but this is one of the standard methods of measuring polyphytic water content. And we have been using this at uh, both sides to measure soil moisture every week so that we know how much water is there in the profile for irrigation management. And later at the end, we also know from this data that how much water is going beyond the root zone. So we have all that data. And then throughout the season, uh, to understand how much nitrogen is being taken up by the plants under each irrigation and nitrogen treatment or nitrogen rate, we collect plant samples three times in the same season and test them for the nitrogen, how much update has been happened. And then the third objective was the remote sensing and proximal sensing. So we have suite of sensors that we use uh, to collect different kinds of data like vegetation and devices, chlorophyll content, leaf area in the understand the crop parameters uh, changes. The change in irrigation and nitrogen rate. And then we will get remote sensing cameras to collect some thermal images so that we can develop some algorithms for in season management of, of water and nitrogen using uh, remote sensing images. In terms of, uh, so I'm going to show you two to three years of data that I have. So the west port side, the better side, two graphs of precipitation on y axis, you see uh, precipitation for rain in inches. The x axis is the uh, time, and you see these three years are a little bit different in terms of how much rain we got. So, in 20 at Westport, in 2022, we got a least rainfall. In 2021, which was a very dry year, there was in the beginning of the season when the crop needs that water the most, we did not get rain. But at Westport, side we typically had. Like mid August, we really got really heavy rains that brought that cumulative precipitation actually higher than 2020. So, total growing season precipitation is planting to harvest in 2021 was 20 inches, whereas in 2020 it was 18 inches. But if you look at the trend, we did not get that much rain when we actually needed it. 2022 was also kind of dry year, but we did have good rains in the, in the growing season. Higher than, higher than 2021. At Becker, slightly different trend, uh, highest in 2020, and then 2021 and 2022 kind of followed the same pattern. Uh, both years have 12 and 30 inches. Long term average, which is 30 years data, if you look at 30 year average of the sites, uh, at Westport, uh, we expect to have to harvest around 25 inches, and at Becker, around 20. So, in short, 2020, in terms of if you just look at this part from planting up to August, the maximum uh, rain was the closest, the closest to long term as it was 2020, but slight difference in the two sides. And that was really uh, dictating the results as well that you are going to see in the next slides how the precipitation at two different sites was different, and so does the irrigation amount. and so at Westport, overall we, we irrigated less than better because we got those timely rains uh, throughout the season uh, and we lesser rain at, at better. In 2020, since it was closest to long term average season, we irrigated least. In 2021, we irrigated most because we did not get that rain in the growing season. And then again in 2022, we irrigated less than 2021 but more than. And same trend at Becker. Now looking at the yield response to nitrogen and irrigation, and how at each irrigation rate and at each nitrogen rate 
how much you eat. You've got these three graphs are on x axis, you have nitrogen, on y axis, for the And this is one of the major objectives, kind of producing this data from this research to look at how corn yield respond to these different nitrogen rates and different irrigation rates. So the line here, different four lines are different irrigation rates. I don't know if you can see that on top. 100%, 57% rainfall. In 2020, this was kind of wet year, not wet year, average precipitation year. We did not see significant differences between the rain yield when we look at the irrigation rate. So all of these lines are on top of each other. So no difference in yield as we increase irrigation or decrease irrigation. So almost same. The rainfall had slightly lower yield than the irrigation treatments. Overall, with increase in nitrogen rate, there is this response curve which is expected. We increase in nitrogen, we increase the quantity yield, and then there is slight, like very high nitrogen. In 2021, however, the results are a little different because we did not get as much rain as we expected. The rain fell was like very low, maybe around 100 meters per year. At Westport, we did not see significant differences. In, in, in rain, even in dry year. And one reason could be those very high or high rain in August, which actually compensated for what we did get in the following season. There is slight decrease in, on, uh, in the lower indicated treatments, but not that much. We compare it to 100% at these three levels of nitrogen. 2022, again, similar trend. We had lower rain than average, rain yield in. Rainfall was significantly lower, but if you compare the three treatments, irrigation treatments, the rain difference wasn't that big. Slight decrease in 50 percent, but 75 percent, 100 percent are almost the same yield. When we look at yield response to irrigation, so x-axis is irrigation, y-axis is yield, we see that there is a trend in the drier years, 2021 and 2022, we increase in irrigation. Kind of increase the yield at mostly at higher nitrogen rates, six times there are six nitrogen rates. But in, in close to average or heavy precipitation year, we don't see that trend. So even we are increasing the irrigation, the rain yield increase isn't that, isn't that much. So almost a straight line. Now, when we go to the better side, since the rainfall pattern was different at two sides, we did see differences in. Rain yield comparing to Westport side. First year, same results, average precipitation year, no difference in irrigation treatments, same yield as you increase the nitrogen, rain yield increases. 2021 and 2022, which were dry years and better. And if I go back, just to remind you, they are really dry years and almost the same. We did find the same results, different than Westport, no yield at all in. Rainfall plots and big differences in irrigated treatments as well. So 100% had the highest yield and 75% and 50% had significantly lower yield than 100% at this site. The reason being lower, lower, lower rainfall. And then similar trends for irrigation. As you increase irrigation, the yield increases, but more response in, in prior years and almost no response in. In, in a normal precipitation year. So that means that timely precipitation actually helps in retaining that soil profile. And we were putting irrigation, but that irrigation wasn't actually resulting in increase in, in, in a normal precipitation year. And this is two years of data. Now we also looked at nitrogen uptake. <laughs> These are West Coast results. 2020, these two graphs and 2021, the top two are not fixed nitrogen uptake, so only the green part of the plant and then the green is separate. So we did not see any significant differences in these four irrigation treatments at any nitrogen rate, mostly at the lower no difference in R6 uh, nitrogen uptake and either in grain. But 2020, because prior year, we did see a significant decrease in grain nitrogen uptake. In rain fed, but almost the same trend or same nitrogen in rain in all the irrigation 
years, even in 2021. And that is also one of the ones relationship with the yield. And even the prior year at Westport, we did not find that significant difference in the yield at Westport. Similarly, for better, if you look at 2021, it's also probably the same time as yield at better. We did see significantly higher R6 prices and updated rain fed plots and significantly lower. Grain nitrogen was taken rain fed plots because most of that nitrogen that we applied it was accumulated in the store and not in the that, that was obvious as well because there wasn't enough water to, for that grain filling in rain fed plot. And we did see significant differences between irrigation treatments in 2021 at better side because of that lack of water in the soil profile and stressed crop. And that's evident from this 50% line at lower grain nitrogen content at better. So these like no important insights into what will happen if we are using some kind of deficit irrigation management in years like 2021 and 2022 and in years which are normal precipitation years and how the site uh, creates. So since we had suction of lysimeters, we also looked at how uh, nitrogen uh, impacted with irrigation. So on x-axis we see irrigation in inches and on y axis, it's uh, nitrate leaching in pounds of nitrogen per acre, and how much you lost below four feet. The top graph is better, and the low, medium, and high lines are three nitrogen rates. So the low one, so I, you remember we had six nitrogen rates, so I divided them in three categories, the lower two rates are low, the medium rates are orange boxes, and then the high are the gray circles. And what we see is that in Becker, as we increase the education, the nitrate leaching actually decreases at all levels of nitrogen. It increases as we increase the nitrogen, but the trend is the same. So as we increase the irrigation and Becker, the nitrate leaching decreases because the nitrogen uptake has increased. So your crop needed that water to uptake that nitrogen from the soil profile. So you were not leaving that nitrogen in the profile for leaching. So that's what happened at Becker. At Westport, we see an increasing trend in nitrate leaching as we increase the irrigation. This tells us that with increasing, there was enough moisture already in there the soil profile and when we added more irrigation to that system, the light nitrate that was soluble there, nitrate, the event are going to be changed. So these two, I mean, we still have to analyze these data sets statistically, but this tells us so much about how the site or how the climate or weather that you got at different sites has an impact on leaching, your nitrogen uptake, your yield. And then plant nitrogen uptake versus irrigation. So how your nitro plant nitrogen uptake impacted by irrigation? We did see an increase in uh, increase in nitrogen uptake at both sites with uh, increase in irrigation, and that's also uh, very obvious because as you put more water, there's more water for crop to uptake, uh, and then along with that water, you are uptaking nutrients. But then there is some point and we have more data, we can maybe complete this curve, but then it's just it's not flattened out at some point of irrigation and then it starts increasing. So, when you put more water in the system, there are chances that we leach that nitrogen instead of updating. So, there is that optimum, optimum rate for each side or each soil level. The expected optimum nitrogen rate, so for each of our treatments, we also looked at what is our UNR. And then I plotted that, just curious to look at how irrigation has impacted that. And for both sides, the net dots are less poor, the rivals are better. You can see an increase in UNR with increase in irrigation, but then it drops down when you have more irrigation. So this is, I know this is lots of data, but I just want to send a message here that we are collecting all of this data to understand the dynamics of water and nitrogen so that we can 
come up with some best management practices that are optimal for both improving our yields and reducing migration. And the remote sensing part, as I said, we did uh, some measurements uh, from proximal sensors that I showed, the way the images remote sensing. And then we did see a big potential of using these data sets and developing some relationships for in season management. So this data is air temperature minus canopy temperature, and to see if the increase in irrigation, to see that trend of increasing the standard, uh, so higher irrigation rates and higher temperatures. That means your canopy is cooler than your air uh, at high irrigation than the rain spread. There is not a big difference between canopy temperature and this kind of data uh, would be very these kind of simulations are helpful for in season management of water. And for, for nitrogen as well, so we collected some uh, normalized difference red and edge measurements, and we did see a trend with increasing nitrogen and this index as well. So these types of data can be used for, for in season, and I'm not going to go into detail of this. Uh, so future plan for this project is we are going to, as I said, continue this project for 2023 and 2024 to collect some more data, and I'm hoping that years are a little bit different. Then our last two years we could really try. And then we are also slightly changing our treatment plan for the next two years to just collect some data when we over irrigate. So we know from our soil moisture sensors what is 100 percent irrigation. Our, we are now adding one treatment, which is 125 percent irrigation, to understand if we apply more water than our soil can hold, what would happen to all those parameters. And then we uh, kind of combine 75%, 50%, 50%, 50 percent, 50 percent, 65 percent. The key findings uh, we did we know that from the three years data, we see that there is the potential of decreasing the amount of irrigation and reducing nitrate leaching losses in years like 2020, which are normal precipitation years. We can do better with maybe limited irrigation, but in years like dry years like 2021. It is depending on what site you are in and how much rainfall you got. And then, on average, uh, what three years of data shows that uh, in average years like 2020, 31 percent reduction in irrigation, 43 percent nitrate leaching, but there was also some yield reduction, 6.5 percent reduction in yield at Becker, which was dry site as compared to other site. At Westport, the 43 percent reduction in irrigation really reduced nitrate leaching. 5%, but we also improved yield by 4%. So, putting more water always is not a good idea, even in, in, in terms of improving yields. Alright, any questions so far? I can take questions before I move to the next project. So, just a, a observation of your data, uh, your R squares were pretty low at one site versus the other. Do you expect those to improve when you have more data? Yes, yeah, that's exactly the reason why I want to collect two years of more data to improve those R squares and see how those and all those relationships that I use just merely data. I haven't done any statistical analysis, even if you know that trend is a uh, real trend or not, but this is something that we collected and I wanted to show you that what we are trying to find. So yes, uh, to answer your question, I expect that with more data our R squares would be better. Any other question? All right, moving on. So this is the project. I think I presented this last year as well with Grant Anderson at the same event, uh, where we were looking at uh, so this is the field in Stones company, uh, and uh, thanks to Grant, he's our partner collaborator who let us use his pivot, which has variable irrigation to test different treatments. And uh, what we actually did is to Evaluated how uniform rate irrigation compared with variable rate irrigation, and what is what are the differences in yield. So, very simple project. What we did is we divided this 120 acres into six pie-shaped treatments. We applied water in these VRI treatments based on these zones. So these zones are created uh, using PC mapping. So we did map this field uh, electrical conductivity. Uh, we had an electrical conductivity. And these three zones of irrigation, and we applied these uh, in these five. We applied the water based on these zones. So, red zone got the least irrigation, 
the yellow zone got medium irrigation and the highest irrigation was in, in uh, the blue zone based on the soil moisture data. We have soil moisture data on these black dots, uh, soil moisture sensors and art scout, uh, soil moisture sensors on all of these locations. And then uniform rate plots, we just irrigated uniformly, no matter how many zones exist in that in that field. And we replicated each treatment field and we can see six spikes. Zone, uh, zone one was four centimeters, one point four inches of uh, available water capacity and fifty percent management allowed in conditions and one point eight and two point one. And this is uh, the very software you can see. The URI dots are all green colored, so same, same irrigation, 100%, and then the URI dots had different irrigation in different zones. And these are the results. So I don't know much data, but you can walk you through it. This is, these two are yield graphs, and these two are irrigation water productivity. So, irrigation water productivity how much yield you produce per inch of water, the bushels per acre inch. 2021 and 2022. Both years we got almost the same data. BRI and URI yield was not significantly different. We found almost the same yield. Slightly lower yield in BRI, which was expected because of the two dry years that we chose the study to take place in. But if it would be wet year, I would expect almost same or higher yield in BRI. And then these lines show the irrigation amount. And you can see how much lower irrigation we have in zone 2 and zone 3 as compared to the uniform irrigation. So on average, BRI reduced irrigation amount by 27% compared to uniform with only one bushel per acre reduction in corn. I haven't done any economic analysis because I don't know. I'm still struggling of finding how much water cost. So if we put the numbers together, I think reducing your yield by only one bushel per acre, but using 27% less water is, is worth it. On average, the irrigation water productivity for URI was 35 bushels per acre inch, uh, which was 30% lower than the BRI, which is 47.3 bushels per acre inch. So, those are the quick results. And as I said, this is the study that we did on farmers field. So we couldn't do nitrogen rates in it to see how BRI interacts with variable rate nitrogen. So that's why we started the study last year at a research part where we are trying to quantify and evaluate the impact of both variable rate irrigation and variable rate nitrogen application to compare this to uniform rates. And this is the treatment design. So we had 25 acres area on our farm that we divided into different treatments. I can explain the, these pie shapes. The black ones are that are getting the uniform irrigation, and the other pies are the ones that are getting variable rate irrigation. And each of these strips, the different colors you see, are different nitrogen treatments, and which are variable rate nitrogen. So I can explain. The first nitrogen treatment is 20% farmer's rate, and farmer's <coughs> model rate is around 220 pounds of nitrogen per acre in the state of corn. So we apply 20% of this at planting, and then the rest of it is variable rate nitrogen. That's based on remote sensing images. So we collect at V8, we collect these uh, UAV and remote sensing images. And based on our NPVI and NPRE data, we decided how much we want to apply in this particular 20% red strip, how much we want to apply in our second split, which is at pH. And then 30% at the second treatment is 30% farmer's rate at planting and then BRM based on remote sensing, then 40% at BRM, and our last treatment which is 50%, these blue lines are 50% farmer's rate at planting and 50% farmer's rate, no remote sensing in this one. We just split this 220 into two. So 110 at planting, 110 at V8. And we're trying to collect soil moisture. So these white lines are zones and these black dots are where we are collecting soil moisture and nitrate leaching. Uh, 
and we try to cover all the nitrogen and all the irrigation treatments under these four management zones. So that we have all of all that data, and we are collecting moisture and nitrate leaching data at each of these locations to understand what's happening if we try to do stuff like this on reverse bar. This is just a preliminary data, and I see that there is, and I don't have anything to share with you, but just wanted to show you what we are trying to do. Maybe next year I'll present some results. But we did see that uh, variable rate nitrogen has the potential, but variable rate irrigation last year being a dry year, we did see slight decrease in uh, yield of corn under the RI plots than under the corn. Any questions about that? Do we take in any account of uh, organic matter nitrogen that's already in the soil or just for nitrogen? Yes. Uh, we do have, no, for application, no, we are just using remote sensing. We use organic matter data and other soil variables for creating irrigation management zones though. So these four zones are created based on three data sets, uh, electrical conductivity, soil texture, and organic matter. So we did collect some soil samples at the beginning of the season on 35 locations in this 25 acre field and develop those maps and then use those three layers to create it, create these management zones for irrigation. But not for nitrogen management. Nitrogen management is solely farmer's rate plus what we get from the remote sensing. Any other questions? Alright, so moving on, I think this is the last uh, thing I want to talk about about the research. This is kind of research and combination of research and outreach project. This is a tool that was developed by Penn and SWCD and then was expanded to East Water Tail Area. I think most of you might know about this irrigation management system tool. Uh, here at the U, we got some funding last in 2021 uh, that we are expanding this to whole state. So right now, uh, previously it was in this Penn and Morrison County and the East Water Tail Pike County area. Uh, our goal is to expand it, of course, to statewide, improve the data inputs with sensors as data for forecast. So we are changing how the weather data is being collected. So previously it used uh, Minnesota Department of X weather station, which are I think 13 now in the state, but they were like very far apart. So our models were not that accurate for the locations where the weather station was too far from, from the field. But now we are using GEMS weather data, which has more uh, high spatial resolution in terms of, of weather data. We are using different models for our weather. We are using machine learning tools and new irrigation tools, uh, models for improving the usefulness of this tool. And of course, doing lots of outreach for uh, like field days and workshops to make everybody understand what the tool is and how to use it. And yesterday I was in uh, Minnesota Educators program that is that we started last year. This, is, this was the second year and right now it's going on. Our first day was yesterday. We are doing it on March 8th and then March 15th. So three-day course where, where we are talking about everything about irrigation, starting from basics of irrigation, soil moisture sensors, tools like IMA, how we use that, hands-on exercise, variable rate irrigation, and many more. And uh, I'm excited to tell you that Next year, we hopefully do it in this area. So, if you are interested, you can participate in that program. The other extension outreach effort that we do, and Darren explained it very well, are the RCPP program. So, the funding is available for that. And then we also do many irrigation and nutrient management. Really, so, if you're interested to learn more about irrigation and look at the plots, uh, I do sandwich research farm field day every year and the Rochewood farm field day at Westport. So, you are most welcome to come there and look at our plots, how we collect the data, and do our research. And then, as I, I, I think I already talked about this Minnesota Educator Program. Uh, yeah, one thing that is, uh, Dan also touched upon uh, Minnesota Ag Water Quality Certification in his slide. And this is something that you can get if you are already certified from Minnesota Ag about this cert uh, quality program. By attending this MIT program, you can get irrigation enforcement that will improve your chances of getting to that pool of money as well. So, 
the irrigation endorsement is something that we provide as an incentive for attending this, this program. And this year it is in Dakota County, March 1st, 18 and 15. Last year it was in St. Cloud, and next year hopefully we will do it in, in this area. And that would be all. Acknowledgement to funding agencies, all this work is being funded by many different sources, AFRAG, that is your growers money that comes to comes for research when you buy the fertilizer, Department of Ag, Minnesota Corn Growers, uh, all the camp by OPI, grass students, and of course all the SWC staff who help us with the research. I can take questions on my Anything, any suggestions for future research? No? What's the best uh, soil capacity for uh, moisture as far as irrigation and production? 50%? You can't keep it at 90%, you know, can't afford it. Yeah. So, depending on what crop you're growing. And I know what you're asking. You're asking that how much depletion I can allow yeah. before I irrigate, right? <coughs> So it basically depends on what stage of the growing season you are at. So at the beginning and the end of the season, when water is not very critical, you can allow your profile to go a little bit down, like 60% depletion. Okay, only 40% in the profile because that's the time when you don't put a lot of water, your roots can grow deeper. And then in the middle of the season, when you when, when it's really critical, like June, here, end of June, July, that's when you might not want to Increase the depletion more than 40% for most of the crops. Does that answer? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's very, I can't give you a number, like, because it really depends on soil, it really depends on your crop, what growth stage you are at, and how much depletion you should allow for that. Any questions? Thanks, Asu. Can we get a round of applause for the students? So moving on, uh, this next part, we're going to go to rotate through with our irrigation uh, and soil, soil moisture sensor booths. Uh, so I'm going to kind of switch guys up in groups. We're going to kind of time it here at uh, 15, 20 minutes at each booth. Uh, and then we're going to rotate clockwise. Yeah, clockwise. So if you're at the CropX Renick, you move, you'll go to MBI. If you're at MBI, you'll go to Earth Scout. If you're at Earth Scout, you'll go back to Renke. So if I could, probably those back three tables that are on your guys' right. Uh, if you guys want to go to Renke, uh, the back three tables on the left, if you guys want to start out at MBI, and then these front six tables, if you guys want to go over to Earth Scout, uh, we'll split up the They'll be doing some talking and showing what they have. Um, with all the discussion that Darren had and the funding opportunities, um, it's good to learn what, what technology each different place has to offer, and, um, what you have available for you out in this region. So, and we'll have a lunch. So. 